truth and truth telling is something uh, which is a territory of incredible political, social, and identity conflicts. There is an app, entire app universe, which is called Social Truth. There are people around who are working on truth in terms of using and weaponizing truth. How does somebody like yourself, who has so much faith in the transformative potential of truth-telling, deal with the fact that through digital and through social media and through all the advances which we have, we are actually getting into a territory where we are losing the grounds of what is reality and not just that we are not discovering what history is, but that the reality on which we are meeting with each other is in doubt. How do you see from your side these struggles, these conflicts, this, uh, let's say, uh, war on truth in terms of uh, moving forward, Tara? Thanks, Peter. <laughs> now you have to earn your keep. <laughs> Is this on? Yes. Yes, okay. It's a big question. Um, I think it's a, it's a big question that lots of people are wrestling with, so I won't say I have the answer. Um, but I will say this. I wonder if there is opportunity, if we think about truth in maybe the way that we think about jazz music. Is everybody familiar with jazz music? Yes. <laughs> jazz isn't one thing. Um, and even in the same song, you have harmony but you also have discordant tones. It isn't about one particular tone that is truer than another um, or that is better than another. But the beautiful thing about jazz is that there is room for it all and it all makes a beautiful sympathy, symphony. So I wonder if the opportunity is to not silence. I mean, people's truths are their truths. There, there's a quote, even though I cannot prove where she said it, I've been searching for this, but I hear that this is absolutely something that she said and I seem to remember it. There's a writer named Toni Morrison um, who wrote some beautiful, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning, amazing Nobel Prize winning author. And she said she wasn't interested in facts. She was interested in truths. There's something about the what we know and what we feel that is true, but is the power, is, is a possibility of the power in surfacing more and more of those truths. Because history is complicated, it's ambiguous, it's nuanced, there isn't one single way to look at it. So perhaps we enter into this space in the way that jazz musicians enter it and we make room for it all. And maybe that takes some of the power away from the things that are harmful. And that is more of my concern is what are the truths that harm people? Um, and how do we heal those spaces so that they're not harming? But it's okay that people have really different perspectives. And the last thing, I'll just say this one last thing. I also think that it's really important that marginalized voices, that voices that aren't often included in understanding the world are given an opportunity to be heard and to rise to the surface. Marcus, Amazing. you Thank feel you. Uh, engaged. I am feeling engaged, yes. yeah. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Tara, for that amazing um, session. 
As you were talking, I was reminded of an African proverb that I only discovered recently, and you were a lion. And the reason that you're a lion is that um, in this proverb it says that until the lion learns to write, that people will only read the hunter's story. And I think that's really a, a brilliant way of summarizing the, the journey that you're on. Um, and it's so important, but I think it can apply to so many different groups around the world. And so thank you for everything that you're doing. Until the lion learns to write, everybody will he hear only the hunter's story. That's the proverb. Yes. Okay. Renuka, what do you make of this conversation before we transit to uh, the more structural and uh, the more economic side of uh, social cohesion creation and hacking? It's on. Is it on? Yes, you, and you speak into it closely, please. Okay. Um, thank you, Tara. Um, I think that in telling the story um, of the transit uh, transatlantic slave uh, trade, it brought back a lot of historical memories about the people of Malaysia because um, there was a lot of trade um, and there was a lot of, they don't call it slavery, but they brought a lot of workers from India and Sri Lanka and China and Indonesia. Um, and it has shaped so much of the history of Malaysia. Um, to the extent of how the population is treated um, and um, how the culture has evolved, you know, and it just took me back to who's telling those stories because history is man-made. Um, and so that, that was very, um, it took me back a lot and I want to thank you for that. Thank you very much, Renuka. Uh, Benedetta, um you are from here, from this country, from a country uh, where storytelling is also uh, a very strong tradition. And uh, Danny started actually with the storytelling about the legend. I don't want to interpret the, <laughs> the story of that. What do you make of this conversation before we move on? Sure, so, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think that it's very important that we keep those stories alive. So Speak into the microphone. Sorry. I think it's very important that we keep those stories alive. Because as time passes, we sometimes forget where do we come from. Um, all the like, different cultures and richness that each of them have and are part of what we are today as a country. Uh, well, as a world, like as a global space. Can I share with you a reflection maybe that's also for the audience and for everybody who is participating in this Congress, uh, an experiential note of this morning with you, Tara, and that is, in order to do storytelling the way you are and truth-telling, you need basically two things. You need time and you need respect. And if you look at uh, digitization, digitization has compressed time. And uh, in the 60s and 70s, people were looking at uh, television advertising and their books on jolts and how advertising is actually creating on television these jolts. But if you look at modern day filmmaking and even video games, you can see that the jolts are not anymore in seconds, but they're in microseconds. And that it is that you are basically, I mean, living in a world of flashes, content flashes, okay? And then on the other hand, you know, the, the key issue in terms of living in bubbles is that you are not giving any respect to anybody outside the bubble, right? So there's a challenge when we look about social cohesion and also investing in content, in applications and things like this, how do we create that, that we are getting funding for things where things are taking time, they are opening up the hearing, like it was very interesting the way you are using audio 
audio and radio as something which is operating in time differently than the visual because you cannot compress the time. Because the moment you compress the time in audio, you are basically losing intelligibility, right? But for the eye, it's different, okay? But on the other hand, you know, how do you work on that in terms of respect? Renuka, tell us a little bit about the Malaysian experience in terms of uh, the kind of investing which is being done and what is being invested in and how it is done and what the environment and the ecosystem in which you work, people are actually moving in this and how this, what we are talking about now, might open up a new reflection on where to go. Please. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I just wanted to make sure everyone was awake because we're all so <laughs> deeply thinking about things. <laughs> uh, and that's good, uh, but also I think that um, the reality about fundraising is something that's on everyone's mind, especially a lot of the young entrepreneurs and the social entrepreneurs that are here. Um, so I just want to share a little bit about what's happening in Malaysia. Um, I think that in terms of technology and entrepreneurship and startups, um, we have our fair share. Um, I'd like to think, of course, that the Malaysians are wonderful, and I believe that. Um, but in terms of attracting funds into the country, we have not done so well. And that's primarily because Malaysians culturally don't tell stories well. They uh, put their heads down, they do great work, they achieve great impact, um, but we don't attract the funds. And I was just telling some stories about, we're kind of in between in Southeast Asia, you have the tier one countries like Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, where most of the foreign investment funds go. And then you have the tier three countries, which are like Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar, where a lot of the philanthropic funds go. But we're in between. So everyone's waiting to see where we get to and do we get to tier one. And so it's a struggle. It's a struggle for companies in Malaysia because you don't get the valuations um, that another country would. Um, I would say that in the past three to four years, there has been a lot more discussion around impact investing. Um, our national sovereign fund has set up, uh, for us it's a big amount, which is one billion ringgit, uh, and it's primarily dedicated to social and environmental impact investment. Um, and that has made a huge change to the ecosystem. Um, you can see now that startups are not just thinking about the tech and scaling, but they're also now more aware about their sustainability and their impact and measuring. And I think that is very, very important because it shouldn't just be about the money. Um, and it, I don't like the, the differentiation between a tech startup and an impact startup. They should all be the same because all of us have our footprints. Um, and that's the flavor that we seem to be moving into, and I think that's a very positive thing. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this is something which, in the future engagement of WSA with Malaysia, we want to basically open up that issues as well, especially also the issues around an interesting new ways of content creation, because this is where WSA has actually also a part of its powerful history, starting looking at how ICTs are used for quality content. It's wonderful. But the other side is, is you know, what is it in terms of strategy when you are looking at assets and how you are working with assets and so on. So what I wanted to ask uh, Bernadita, you are working uh, and you have a, even a job title working with alternative assets. What, just tell us a little bit about what you do and in which way this environment in which you are working in can be transformed in terms of hacking social cohesion. Sure, so, well, it was a simple question for an early morning. Uh, 
No, so I work at a leading financial institution in the region. We oversee 50 southern clients, 9.5 assets under management. So the role of my team is to review investments for clients. And those are traditional investments to fulfill their financial goals. But also we seek to build with our clients um, investments that allow them to generate impact in society. So it's important to understand that impact investing is not just another asset class, it's a way of investing. And I think li linking to the point of purpose of a business, when we understand that our businesses have purpose that serve a better goal, they're gonna be more sustainable also financially. So, yeah, so, well, what criteria do we use? Um, it's essential to look at teams. How do they work? How do they function? You need to understand that, like, you, you need to make this the less black box possible for the investor. The investor needs to know what is going to be done. And that when we talk about impact is a big challenge because how do we measure impact? That's, that's a very difficult like, point to tackle uh, when you are reviewing investments. Let me just stick with this point. Impact measurement has a quantitative as well as qualitative side to it. So the quantitative side of it is there is about 250 people in this room now and the impact of WSA is that there are 250 people here. But as you know, feel, and understand, this is not the impact, right? So what is it in terms of your own work where the qualitative becomes something which you are getting a handle on? And let me give you the end thought of this question. Is it storytelling? Yes. So we try to translate it to, like to numbers, not a number, but we use scorecards. So ba basically what we do is we understand what are those criteria where businesses are building something. Um, so when you evaluate some, like an investment, you, also, you need to look at quantitative aspects, but also qualitative aspects, but in a measurable, measurable way, because we all have biases. If I review a project, I don't know, uh, two years from now, probably I won't be able to compare it in a fair way to another project that I'm also looking at. So if, well, what we have developed are scorecards. This is basically like international guidelines. And I believe it's a way to, to work to transform those qualitative asset, like aspects in quantitative ways of understanding a, a problem and measuring its impact. So I will hand out questionnaires and say, how many new ideas did everybody get here? So if you have five new ideas per person, then this is a real impact story. And then if one real, uh, idea is being realized, that's even more on the scorecard. Is that right? Something like this? Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> OK, very good. Uh, Marcus, uh, you are working in Silicon Valley, so the people don't give you such an easy time out as I'm giving you all here now, <laughs> because they're a little bit tougher here. When you're looking at it from uh, your company, and when you are looking at it in terms of Venture Forge uh, and uh, how you are with your partners are working, how you, you are dealing with that issue of impact, impact measurement, quantity, quality, and then leading into finally questions of storytelling, please. Thank you, Peter. Um, look, it's a big question. Um, uh, you know, many of you heard me talk yesterday about the sort of journey that I've been on. I have to start with a story, actually. So 
which will explain why I'm going to share some controversial views. So I live on an island called Mercer Island. It's a little island. It's 10,000 acres. It's in the middle of Lake Washington. And to the north of Mercer Island is a company called Microsoft. Um, to the, um, the west of Mercer Island is another little company called Amazon. And then um, over to the east is another little company called T-Mobile, which for those of you who don't know is the world's largest telecommunications company by market cap. So Mercer Island is very unusual because the people that live there typically have worked for one of those companies. And actually, many people that live there work for all of those companies because they just kind of cycle around. And why I share that with you is that as much as I enjoy living on that island, it's a reminder to me that there is a challenge in the United States in that whatever we're doing today is not working. And the reason I say that is that the level of income inequality in the United States is getting bigger. The concentration of wealth is getting worse. So I can take a 15-minute drive across the bridge from Mercer Island to Seattle and see levels of poverty that you would not expect in the United States. And yet still, I then go to an event where people who are impact investors will tell me, we're doing so great, look at our index chart. Everything is wonderful, we've done dit, 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 dit. Here's my qualitative um, data and here's my quantitative data and everything is fantastic and let's high five and let's drink champagne. No, I'm sorry people, it's not working. What we do today does not work. And the fact that you see that income inequality there is a testament to that. And so to answer the question, one of the things that has inspired us to create VentureForge is acknowledging that all of the important macro level indices are going backwards, in that wealth is concentrating further into the hands of a smaller number of people, and that income inequality is increasing. We believe that the best way to address that is by stimulating the spark of entrepreneurship that we know exists in all levels and all walks of life in the United States and beyond. And so whilst I salute all of the existing models that we have and the impact investment funds that exist and the different mechanisms that we have and social enterprise and social entrepreneurship, I do believe passionately that we need to do more. And what we hope to do at VentureForge is create a model that truly looks at how we can take the surplus wealth that is being created by some of the people that are my neighbors, unfortunately, and how we can get some of that wealth into the hands of impact entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs who need capital in order to tackle the problems that humanity is facing. So I'll stop there because I'll talk for hours otherwise. No, you, were, you wanted to issue an invitation for WSA to come to your island for our next global congress. Yes. I realize this, that, that you're just uh, making a pitch, okay? <laughs> Very good. Tara, you started off with your uh, story today by linking up with this space, and you said um, there was a time not long ago where you were working for a startup Chile. When you look at this uh, the reflection now of your last five years being... Uh, engaged in um, the scuba diving, uh, being financed by uh, the National Geographic, uh, and then go back again to where Startup Chile has evolved from over the last uh, 10 years. What is your take on in which way social impact investment can actually support and work for types of work like you do? Not exactly that work, but types of work like this. And for all the other people who are in this audience here who are really trying to think, how do I engage, how do I make this kind of in-depth moving storytelling part of the work which I do, but not derail it in terms of the financing which I need for my work? Tara, please. You got all the really big questions, Peter. <laughs> That's Great. the He's reason like, why you're getting coffee afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no coffee when you're not good at answer, <laughs> or at least coffee without sugar. Go ahead. I think, so I'm going to 
I'm going to say something, but then I think I want to ask a question back to you guys, because uh, I'm curious about your perspective on this. When I did uh, Startup Chile in 2012, I had a, a social enterprise um, that supported girl change makers around the world, and we were trying to help these change makers do the work in their communities, and we were trying to help them raise money and tell stories about the work that they were doing. Um, and I ran the social enterprise for six years, and it was hard. Like, it was really hard to monetize it. We were able to attract some funding. So we got funding from Startup Chile, we got funding, funding from Toyota, from other philanthropic organizations, but it was hard trying to build a business model. And we spent a lot of time in Startup Chile trying to figure out how do we monetize this? How do we make it make sense? Um, and I don't know that we were successful. Like I ran the enterprise for six years and during that time, I took a second job because <laughs> um, we, we weren't able to attract enough money to really pay for team. The work that I'm doing right now with National Geographic comes from grants that they give to me. So my first um, bit of travels with the divers, I got their level one grant, and that was the money that I needed to be able to travel and tell the story. And then I went back to them for more funding to be able to do the podcast. And they gave it to me, and so that's how we were able to do that. And now with this project, which is a really ambitious, big, expensive project, and Nat Geo is funding a part of it, but we're also gonna be in a fundraising conversation to get more funders because it's um, an expensive project. But without National Geographic's endowment, its funding, I probably wouldn't be able to tell this story and to do this work. And I think that this work is important. Um, and it's work that maybe doesn't need a business model. Like maybe, yeah, so I guess the question that I wanna ask you guys, um, and I imagine this might be the case for some people in the room, social entrepreneurship is really hard when you're trying to have three Ps and you gotta, it's all the things. And you're still trying to run a business, which is hard in and of itself, but then you're trying to change the world. So I wonder, like, what is your thought? And I would ask this to you as well about, well, and we do have room for philanthropic efforts, but this idea of trying to turn impact work into work that generates its own income is hard. Yeah. Like, is okay, that necessary? We have understood the question, and now uh, Renuka will... Did I get the question out? You yes, know what yes. I'm trying to ask? Renuka okay. will answer it first, and then we go over to Patricia, and then uh, to Marcus, and then I will wrap it up, because we are having a coffee break afterwards. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll look forward to that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. I really am so glad because I think there is a lot of effort that the social enterprises um, and social impact companies are doing to find those sustainable business models and how they're going to scale and how they're going to survive. But and then I'm going to sound a little controversial here, but this is from Malaysia, so I'd, lo I'd like to, to hear uh, Marcus's thoughts especially. Um, who's working with the ones with the funds? Who's telling them that when you give out funds, the sort of metrics and measurements that you are putting out there does not work for the social enterprises? you are forcing them into models, into um, work that you think is going to make a difference, like capability development, say, for example. There's so much money that goes into social enterprises 
from CSR funds, from foundations, from philanthropic funds, that all say, I want you to teach them how to fish. But once you've taught them how to fish, the next step for the social enterprise is finding a market for people to buy that fish. But the funds don't fund that. The funds want more capability development. And so social enterprises need to actually work on whatever it is they are working with the communities to develop. They need demand side, and they need help with the demand and the sales, and then to continue the good work that they do. But because the way the grants and the foundations and the philanthropic funds think, and the CSR projects that these corporates want to showcase and tell stories about, don't actually understand each of those social enterprises and what they need to do. Very good. It's like uh, education, and then you have PhDs who are taxi drivers because there's no demand for what they have learned. Yes. Thank you very much, Renuka. Bernadita, please. Do you have a microphone? Yeah, we're great. Yeah, I think that, at least in my opinion, uh, these type of challenges need to be addressed uh, by multiple actors. So, for us, like, what do we do on our day-to-day, day-to-day, is to work and produce the best financial returns for our clients that are high net worth individuals, foundations, and uh, endowments. So, then they have their, like, philanthropical uh, like projects. We, we work with a lot of foundations that basically they are financing their day-to-day -day operations. And our role is very important in that preservation of capital. But then in the other side, you can, can produce new solutions. So for example, last year we worked with a, a corporation that's called Bien Publico, and we developed a solution where our clients can fina finance through social bonds some specific goals related to education in vulnerable parts of Chile. And then you have a third party that is willing to pay if, that goals are, um, if those goals are met. So this is not gonna be like a great return for clients, it's like a normal return, but then you have the purpose in there. So if you work on building those solutions with different stakeholders from the public, private sector, then you have relationships and you build relationships with the people that are making the, the change. It's not like a one-time financing. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that is uh, very telling and I will come back to right away because what you are doing is both you're giving a very good answer to the individual entrepreneur. Marcus, what is your answer to this question from Tara? Yes, and I'll, I'll make it quick. So I'm glad that Tara's here today because um, we haven't met before, but as we discussed yesterday, I used to be on the leadership team of National Geographic. How many of you have heard of National Geographic? Raise your hand if you've heard of National Geographic. Of course, it's one of the most, it's one of the revered, most revered brands in the world. National Geographic, um, in the early 2000s was going to disappear. And the reason it was going to disappear is that philanthropy doesn't work. And so it was an organization that was entirely funded by philanthropic donations. And they had to embark on a different strategy because literally it was months away from disappearing. And they did something incredible. They realized that they needed to become more of a social enterprise. And they found the most unusual of partners. Does anybody know which partner National Geographic found to save it? It was Fox, the Fox Group. Yes, the people that do Fox News and Fox Sports. They acquired 73% of National Geographic and took ownership of the brand and created a new entity called National Geographic Partners. That provided a cash injection into the National Geographic Society of just over a billion dollars. That billion dollars is the money that funds the activities for people like Tara today. Now, why am I sharing that with you? Because there's a clue there into what we need to do in the future. The existing models do not work. We need to find new innovative models that do work 
and the leadership at National Geographic were very forward-thinking in doing what was a very bold move with an organization that was not the natural partner, but an organization that brought the business skills and the capabilities to take, an organization that was entirely focused on impact, but needed to operate in a world of commercial realities. And it was a partnership that to this day many people don't understand. When National Geographic Partners was acquired, it was acquired by Disney. So now Disney owns 73% of National Geographic Partners. That is how that organization will survive, and that is how fantastic explorers like Tara will get the money to do the things that they need to do. And so I believe that we need to be looking at macro level innovation like that as a way of unlocking the capital needed to support people like Tara. I think you're very good in storytelling. <laughs> um, there's a chap in the room here. Some of you have seen him. This is Osama Manza. Osama, you want to get up? Just get up for a second. No, no, you don't, you're not allowed to speak. You know, you're not allowed to speak. But he got me involved in asking all the jurors of the grand jury in Hyderabad to contribute to a book which you are finding outside. Now, I think we have 100 copies of it, which looks at social ecosystems and also social impact. And the reason why I mention this is because I take this conversation today to do a follow-up book together with Osama, exactly on looking at these various different kind of stories. So we started uh, for many of the grand jurors and uh, the board of directors of WSA with a meeting last Friday with uh, Kasha Los Angeles Andes here. And it's very interesting to see a leading financial institution to take charge in creating an entire ecosystem for social entrepreneurship. I'm looking at what Renuka has said in terms of the challenges which she has. I'm looking at uh, the things which you have said now in terms of uh, the case study of um, uh, even National Geographic. That's something you can learn something from. What Benedita is uh, working on in terms of uh, the alternative asset strategy which she has and things like this. So that is something which I want everybody here to contribute and feel free and engage and I will give you out a little card later on to give you also a little ticket to engage because there's some people here already whom I've talked to earlier. That is a legacy from this conversation. Let me close this conversation with two points which are essential for you to understand why WSA is here today and might be here and, and other places there tomorrow. And that is, we have jettisoned the notion of business model for social enterprises. We use the term financing model because it means that you are not all the time wearing off the street and ending up in the ditch of having to do profit. What you have to do is, is you have to cover your costs, you have to pay decent salaries, you have to give people a chance to develop professionally, you have to make sure there's an equity in terms of women being paid the same or more than men, and things like this. That's covering your costs, and for that you need financing. But it does not mean that you have to be on the business side. That's the micro level. The other thing which each and every one of you have to understand, and especially those who of you who are politicians, and I'm very happy that Jayesh is here, not because he's a politician, but he is the leader in India and in Telangana State for thinking about economic development and how it works together with digitization. It has very much to do with a very critical aspect, and that is how are markets being shaped by governments and regulation? And what does it mean? We have in economic theory something which is called externalities. So these are costs which are created by you, what we are doing today here. The costs in terms of, for instance, CO2 uh, footprint which we have, right? 
And the issue here is that governments need to make sure that these costs are not just transferred to everybody else and especially to the planet, but that these costs are actually being part of what each and every activity has to pay for. So when you are bringing the externalities in, in terms of what you have said now, very much you go over the bridge from your island into Seattle, and you see there, under the bridge there, people, I mean, having their shanty houses destroyed by the police because they are needing to be moved there because some neighbors have complained about it, and they are just moving to the other side of the next bridge, okay? That is externalities. Externalities of people being then drug addicted, uh, having opium problems, having blah, 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 and things like this. So there are two things. WSA is very clear. What we need to do is, is we need to have sustainable financing models, and we have to also be aware that externalities need to be included in every activity. That way, Planet Hack will work. Thank you very much for this morning. <laughs>